the, the basic, the basis of the theory is just that Wall Street knows what it's doing, that prices move on stock markets in particular, but financial markets in general, for a good reason, because all these investors and speculators are bringing all this information and opinion to bear and are therefore delivering the best possible assessment of what a particular stock or bond or whatever else is worth. And I mean, part of the attraction of it is at some level, it, it's at least partly true. Stock markets aren't, they're not completely driven by noise. They're not completely driven by irrationality. If they were, I, I think we would have decided to get rid of them at this point. Although I guess a lot of people make money off them, so you never know. But, but still, there, there's some element of rationality and reflection of fundamentals going on in market behavior. So that's one reason why it's attractive. The other reason why it's attractive, and, and especially the version of it that um, was born or reborn in the 1960s and really became incredibly influential in the 70s and 80s and 90s, is it just makes life so much more simpler. If you simply just go from the starting point that financial market prices are right, then you can do so many great things. You can calculate the cost of capital really easily if you're a corporate decision maker trying to decide whether you want to do an investment or not. You can pick out an investment strategy that makes sense, that balances risk and reward appropriately very easily. You can basically approach the market in this scientific fashion that can be taught to other people and handed down to other people. It isn't all about gossip or people's strange opinions. It's this scientific, straightforward um, guide to decision making in and around the market. One of the fascinating things that's going on right now is a bunch of economists, um, Paul Krugman and Brad DeLong among them, trying to come up with a pretty much rational explanation of bubbles, of how bubbles work and what the, what the interaction is between leverage and bubbles and, and, and what causes them. And I, I think it, I, I'm fascinated by it. I don't know if it'll deliver any real answers, but it's just sort of this attempt to use the fact that even people who in their individual position as a hedge fund manager or whatever are behaving entirely rationally to maximize their own well-being, it creates these systems where markets go bonkers. And, and I think the lessons that will probably come out of that is just leverage is dangerous. Um, but that's, that's really interesting to me. Another area that there are some people that just go head over heels for, and I'm interested in it, and I talk about it at the end of the book, is this whole idea that maybe we can come up with different ways of modeling market behavior that sort of take in the fact that investors are constantly learning, but that at the same time, the, the markets that they're trying to understand are constantly changing. So it's this constant process of sort of moving towards getting things right, but then markets continually moving, moving away from that so that there's never any perfect moment. There's never any equilibrium. And there are lots of people, some, some of them physicists, some of them economists, trying to put, a, put together these various, they call them adaptive markets or... Um, I mean, complexity is another term of art for this. It was all very fashionable in the early 90s. Everybody sort of forgot about it for a while. Now it's back. I just don't know where it leads. There, there, nobody's come up, gotten any answers out of it yet as to how markets behave. I definitely, I mean, all these people want to come by and visit an economics columnist for time. So I've been talking to a lot of these people. I mean, I guess there's some potential maybe for creating these... What, what basically amounts to securitized lending, but in a more transparent, straightforward way. Um, be, but I, I don't know. I, I, at some level, I, I think we're still figuring out how a financial system actually works. We, we thought for a little while that all this stuff had been solved by basically moving everything out of institutions like banks onto markets. But it, it just turned, it's just not that easy. I mean, markets debt markets turned out to be incredibly dependent on the rating agencies to tell investors what to buy or not. And that, that turned out to be, I mean, they were worse than banks at de determining what's a good loan and what's a bad loan. And, and so I, don't, I just don't know what kind of institutions are going to exist. I mean, I think it's very intoxicating to hear about a place like Kiva, which has all these people in the U.S. making tiny loans to somebody starting a bakery in Peru. And it's all very cool. 
Although, I mean, Kiva's been so, so successful in part because there's no attempt to actually make a profit off it. So maybe it's not a business model. It's just this new model for um, organizing charity. Mm -hmm.